My name is Peter van der Veen. In Dutch it is Peter van der Veen. And actually I have three first names. Jan Peter Hendrik. <laughs> so J.P.H. van der Veen. And van der Veen is spelled in three words. I was born 14th of May 1927. On a hill about five kilometers in a place called Rampepau. It's in the Toraja area of South Sulawesi, Indonesia. My parents had, uh, we were four. My sister was the oldest one. She was born in 1920. And my older brother was born in 1923, myself 27, and my younger brother in 1933. My mother taught us elementary school at home through a correspondence course every three months she had to send some tests to Holland and it took a month because to, for the ship to get to Holland and you get a reply if they, they, they corrected or the tests and so. So my older sister and then when we, once we were ready for high school then we went to Java and there was a family in Java, okay, two families, where we would stay during school time because there were no uh, secondary schools in our area in Dutch also elementary schools, there were no Dutch elementary schools, there were Toraja and Indonesian elementary schools, but not Dutch ones. So um, we were taught at home by my mother uh, elementary education, and then ready for high school or junior high school, we went to Java. I have to make a distinction between the time that I was on Java for high school and the time that I was at home. At home, I didn't have much contact with other Dutch children, except there was other missionary families and the doctor's family and so forth, which I would meet maybe once, once a week or once, yeah, once every two weeks or something. And uh, the our, our parents, uh, Indonesian staff, they lived a little bit out uh, away from our house, so I didn't see their children eat much either. Some of them a little bit. So we were mostly my younger brother, myself. We were together and my parents spent time with us and my father had a special one afternoon a week that he would play games with us, that he would not work in his work. And uh, so, and then we with the local staff, we had other games, we did games on the hill itself, uh, badminton and other games and uh, they had a kind of say, a blowpipe and you could direct a blowpipe that was an Indonesian uh, kind of uh, instrument. and that targeted, uh, so we did with the local staff uh, which my parents had on, on in our house, they we did these games also once a week or so. The, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was in uh, December 7, 1941, and then I was, uh, I have to calculate, <laughs> I was 14 I think, and um, yeah, next next spring I became 15. The um, yeah, I was 14 when the war broke out, and uh, when when the Dutch East Indies Army capitulated, it was March March 42, and that was uh, a month or two before my 15th birthday. At that time, uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and also some places in the Philippines. They didn't bomb Indonesia yet at that time, but maybe Singapore, or I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, we first, oh, uh, we had also had to dig a trench and there was uh, practice. We had had to practice for um, uh, air attacks, so the sirens would go and you had to go in the trench and then wait there till the si siren sets all clear. So those were the first uh, wartime experiences. I was a boy scout at that time and I think as a boy scout they assigned me to do that messenger work. Um, and I didn't know but that my parents would be coming. Um, they, they came I think with the last 
commercial flights still available because they felt the children were all in Java and everybody at that time thought that Java would hold out longer than the other islands. And um, yeah, there was uncertainty, but uh, uncertainty for everybody. <laughs> the one thing which made a sad impression on us is when the Dutch army capitulated, then the soldiers who had been on the front lines came down, walking down in Bandung, where we lived at that time, and all as the white uh, cloth around their arms, and of course the weapons had already been <laughs> left behind uh, for the Japanese to take over. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was the first sad experience, I think, when the military were imprisoned. And we, um, there were also some Australians, and uh, I, I remember we went to, our school had been converted, had been changed into a emergency hospital. So we went to visit the wounded people in the hospital, where we were still free. But the military had already been assigned to the camps at that time, P POWs. Well, an another thing was one time in Bandung, um, at the time I was doing this uh, uh, messenger service, um, I was downtown Bandung and there was a uh, uh, bombing attack uh, on Andir, which is the airport of uh, the Dutch East Indies Army and civilian airport at the same time. And there was uh, a bomb had fallen in. I was on my back, and a bomb had fallen in uh, uh, some houses of Indonesians, and they asked me to come and help. And I was, you know, 14 years old or something. I, I, but I had my Boy Scouts uniform on, so um, I did go and look and say there was somebody had been wounded. So I went back to my back and called somebody from the first aid to help these people. That was my only actually direct confrontation with people who died in the in the war apart from later on in the camps i start with my brother um he was 18 i think at the time and when the uh, pearl harbor attack occurred and then the, all the dutch boys of 18 age were uh, drafted and i mean he chose the Navy, or I think, yeah, you could express preference, but his basic training was the same as everybody, whether they went to the Army or to the Navy. And I remember that one thing after he, you know, he was in this training, basic training, um, he came back to the house one time. I think he didn't come back very often, maybe once or twice only. And then he lit a cigarette. He had never smoked before. And then I heard him explaining what he had to go through for his basic training. He said, well, we had to put a bayonet on a rifle and there was a dummy person and you have to put the bayonet in the dummy person, killing a person, you know. So he was being mentally trained to be a killer. And so that affected him. I think he started smoking. It was, uh, you know, that, that I still remember that. Um, then, of course, we didn't see him anymore because he was then taken to Surabaya, which is on the eastern part of Java Island, and we were in Bandung in the western area. And uh, this Dutch Navy base was in Surabaya, so he got his training in Surabaya. Then he was taken with a group from Surabaya to Chilachap. Chilachap is a harbor on the south coast of Java. I think the only harbor on the south coast, the other harbors are on the north coast. And um, they were put with a group of trainees for the Navy on a ship which was to go to Australia, a uh, freighter, and uh, the Chisarua. And so I think several hours sailing south of Java, the people on the Chisarua saw Japanese reconnaissance plane, so they spotted this ship. and. Um, then the Japanese Navy came and took the ship. The ship had no arms, had no, was not, uh, uh, not the Navy ship. So they took them prisoner. And uh, 
there was a person with my brother who later on told us a bit about it, or he wrote about it, and apparently he said when the Japanese Navy ships came from one side, apparently my brother told the other uh, colleagues or the other Navy people with him, let's go to the other side of the ship because he was afraid that they would start machine gunning or so this. So that's what he told. And now, then they took these uh, people of that ship and took them to Makassar, which is the capital city of Sulawesi. And they were put in jail, that's uh, the prisoners of war, but uh, jailed in Makassar for about six months, from March 42 till August, I think, maybe less than six months. But when they were working in that, they were prisoners of war in that prison in Makassar, they, one of the jobs they had to do was cleaning a brothel which the Japanese had set up there. And he, they, he told me, this other fellow who had been with my brother later, told us, he lives in Montreal, Canada, told us that um, these women were crying for help, you know, when they, when they saw these uh, 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 Dutch and other prisoners there in the bottle to clean the bottle. So um, that was already one aspect of, uh, you know, and that was probably forced, forced um, prostitution by the Japanese. So um, then he was taken on the ship to Japan in, I think, maybe in November, October, so, uh, 42. And uh, they had to work on a shipyard on an island just off the coast in Nagasaki. And um, there he had an accident. He, he had to uh, work on a uh, shipyard. And so they had to climb high up. And then apparently one time in February 45, he had to carry a big beam or something by somebody else, and he tripped over something and he fell down and he broke his neck. So the, all the prisoners of war who died in Japan were cremated, and the urn was turned over to the uh, American Navy after the war in '45, and the American Navy uh, gave them to the Dutch authorities, and the Dutch authorities asked my father, um, where you want it buried, you want to bury it in the official uh, honor uh, cemetery. Uh, my, my father chose to have it buried in the place where he was born. So my father took the urn and my brother is buried in a small um, cemetery where missionaries and uh, families of missionaries were buried in the, the Toraja area. That's my brother's, my brother's story. Well, we were, my sister, and my mother, my sister, and my younger brother, and myself, we were then, uh, say, in, I think, November 42, had to go in a women's camp. That was a section of town, with small houses, and uh, you, each family was assigned in one house, but then later on, they were more crowded, more people had to be uh, sharing the space. And so, in the beginning, you could still go in and out of the camp. There was there was a fence around it, and there was also uh, this matted bamboo, uh, so that you could not look out. But uh, you could go through the main gate. And uh, since my brother didn't have much money, and at that time you still had to buy your own food. And um, so we, my sister and I, did a little, uh, started a little shop. We went to the city bought sugar, other things, flour or something, I sold it and let shop and made profit some, um, a, a little shop. But then later on the main gate was closed too and the people could go in and out anymore. And then at one time we got a warning, somebody told us to hide down, the big boys should be hiding because they are rounding up the, rounding up the big boys. And so I stayed in that little house. And uh, but then they came the police. I think this. I think it was Indonesian. Yeah, the Japanese used Indonesian police at that time to so, um, to watch the prisoners. So um, they found me, and then they said, "Well, tomorrow you have to be ready and to report at the gate. Take a little mattress with you, or a blanket, or something, and all your some clothing and your personal belongings as much as you can carry yourself." <laughs> 
So, yeah, then I had to show up that next day, and then they took us to a boys camp. I had to say goodbye to my mother, my sister, my brother. And my sister, younger brother, my mother, stayed in that women camp, Chihapit, in the southern part of Bandung. Um, I think there were about 10,000 or so people in that camp. And then gradually they were taking women from that camp, transferring them to other camps. Uh, some in East Java or Middle Central Java, some in uh, Jakarta. And um, so other women were transferred earlier. My, my mother and my sister were transferred in, I think, in June 45, yes, or something. Not so long before the end of the war. Um, but that transfer of my mother and my sister, my younger brother, was very hard because they were in a, in a train for a day and a half, I think, without water and so forth. So um, the people already undernourished, so they suffered quite a bit of the uh, train transport to Jakarta, too. And so um, my mother then died in that uh, camp in J Jakarta, a women's camp there. That was one of the worst uh, camps, actually, the Chiden camp. And uh, so my sister and my younger brother. Oh, my brother, my younger brother had already been taken out too um, from the Chihapit camp in Bandung. And he was put in another boys camp, later a man's camp, I think, uh, where we, not, we were not with him. So he was by himself there for a while. Uh, and that affected him his, his, uh, mentally very much, that he was taken out away from my mother because, you know, he had lived in the sort of protected area of, uh, in, in, of Indonesia with... Uh, he, he was very much attached to my mother, let's put it that way. Anyhow, so um, my sister, yeah, my sister also had to be hospitalized, I think, right after the war. And my aunt, uh, who was also in a women's camp in Jakarta, uh, she survived, but then she died uh, two or three weeks after the war, uh, because most it was because of uh, undernourishment and some uh, dysentery, uh, infectious disease, and um, they just it was a dysentery, you have diarrhea all the time, and, and there was no medicine. There, there is medicine available, but we were not given that medicine. Uh, I would say one thing which we probably overlook sometimes is the mental anguish people had when they were separated from their children, especially in the case of my mother and my, my, my younger brother, because um, my younger brother uh, was taken out from my mother's camp, um, I think about, about a year before, before the end of the war. And then he was first in the section for boys, only young boys, and then in a bigger camp for men. And then my mother was shipped off to uh, 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 Jakarta, the other place. And then when he found out that my mother died, you know, that was a big blow to him. And that caused this, I think, this mental problem for him that he later on committed suicide. So um, he was, um, you know, 11, and nine, 9, I think, first, and then I think probably 11 when he came out of the camp, something at that age. They were first put, all the big boys, uh, they didn't look at your age, but they, how tall you were. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so with big <coughs> boys <coughs> in that boys camp, but we didn't stay there long. It was a big building, and there were a few adult men there, uh, Dutch men, uh, civilian prisoners. And then we were transferred to another camp, and that was the camp for civilian prisoners of uh, where my father was happened to be. So, in a way, that, I was fortunate that that came at my father's camp. Uh, myself and my father then were transferred from that men's camp, L-O-G, uh, camp to another camp, bigger camp in Bandu, and from there to a little uh, camp in Chimahi, which is a uh, garrison place of the Dutch East Indies Army. They had barracks there. I think it's a little map uh, in the book um, where we stayed, and we also were there with about 10,000 people. And in the beginning, um, there were not so many restrictions. Of course, you could not go out and so, and the food or so 
in the beginning it was a little bit better and later it gradually decreased. But uh, we had uh, some lessons. Uh, I had lessons, uh, there was an Englishman there. Uh, I had some English lessons and I had uh, history and uh, some mathematics. Uh, some, we had taken some school books with us. But then gradually, I don't know, after, maybe after six months or so, then all the young, younger people had to work. So no more, no more lessons, no more studying. But the older people, they had uh, quite some activities. Uh, my father, for example, in the beginning there were, uh, they allowed some Indonesian newspapers, uh, actually by a Chinese Indonesian um, company, uh, newspaper company, but they, of course they were censored, they could, could only give the news uh, which was uh, not offensive to the Japanese. But my father translated that into Dutch for the other prisoners. And then um, later also my father had groups um, to discuss what the relations should be in the future between the, the Netherlands and Indonesia. And because there had been already movements in Indonesia for independence, there was a representative council, like a House of Representatives, but it was dominated by the Dutch. There was a minority of people of Indonesian origin. And, um, but so they were discussing how the future should be for Indonesia. Uh, then also my father went around um, to the sick people. He had, I, I remember, he had a little folding chair and he took it around and a little Bible with him and then visited the sick and sometimes the dying people. Uh, we had the man, we had a little cubicle with about three people in it, four, three or four, and a very tall fellow um, which, where which we shared that space and um, he um, was a very athletic person but very tall. And so the bigger f uh, f uh, physical uh, body you had, the more the lack of food was affect you. The smaller people suffered less than the bigger people. And we saw, I could see, he had got swollen feet for a very, very, I think it's called, I don't know, lack of, um, I think, protein or, or, I don't know. Anyhow, he had some kind of um, sandals or so, walk and so you could see the moisture of his footprints in the, in the corridor, uh, in these barracks, we were staying in barracks. Uh, another interesting thing was that, um, there were some people in our camp who in some way had contact with some Japanese from outside officer to buy gold or watches. So, and for a long time, the Japanese allowed a little shop in the, in the camp where you could buy some extra food, some uh, gula jawa, which is the brown sugar, uh, or tapioca flour and people were allowed to make little fires out of the barracks and make porridge or something to add it to their diet. And of course on, in this barracks we were here and um, there's a, a corridor in the middle and here were these cubicles and this man across from us somehow had contacted a contact with a Japanese officer from outside and he was buying. So my father finally sold his wedding ring uh, to get some money to buy some extra food in the store. And then after the war, when my mother had died, and my father was carrying my mother's ring after us. So, and then the other interesting thing was that the, we had something like, I think, oh, a barracks to the left of us, separate, were the Dutch Nazis, the Dutch uh, the people, people of Dutch nationality, but he were for the Nazi party the Dutch Nazi party, and they were in one barracks by themselves. <laughs> I, I don't think they got extra food, more than food than we, at least I can't tell. But then we had also, on the other side was a barrack of people all from Armenian origin, because they were considered allied if, with the allied side, because they had come from Turkey or whatever, wherever they, they had established themselves in Indonesia, either shopkeepers or industry, small industries or something, but since they were neither Dutch nor Indonesian, they were also in the camp. And then we had about 
oh, I would say maybe 600 or so, two, two or three different barracks in, 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 near ours with uh, Indonesian Chinese or Chinese Indonesians. And they were considered the dangerous part of the Chinese Indonesian community because they were the most pro chunking pro, pro chaka Czech people. And um, somehow they were able to smuggle some things in sometimes, and I don't know personally, I haven't seen them, but at a certain moment we got orders that any food you had which privately had to be dumped, had to be thrown away, and I was told, I didn't see it myself, that the people in this Chinese bar barracks had some uh, coconut oil for cooking of uh, food and had to dump it. And we had still some uh, tapioca flour, uh, uh, what is tapioca? And uh, I made a little porridge and then we were hiding it and threw it away <laughs> so that we would not be um, uh, punished. But sometimes there was collective punishment uh, that the little shop was closed and you were not allowed to have any f private food and they would search you and you know, sometimes people tried to hide it under their little mattress or under, under their mat or something. And uh, so uh, another thing of collective punishment was that you could not sit with more than three or four people together. So, uh, so at that time these groups of men who used to discuss the future and so they couldn't meet, but then the collective punishment was we lifted. Uh, or also there was, when there was no collective punishment, there were some musicians in the camp who had been allowed to take their instruments with them. And on Sunday afternoon there would be a concert and uh, there was a big meeting hall or something in the middle of the camp. Uh, and that could be used for church too for a while, but then again that was forbidden. Um, but um, so periodically the, the, there were more facilities available than other, other times in the camp. Yeah. And of course we had to start, the, the younger people, I think I said, uh, after the first six months or so then we couldn't have our lessons anymore because we had to go out and work outside. Uh, the Sundays were, were free, so we worked five days or six days a week. Uh, in my case, I had with about 500 or so people had to work outside in a farm to plant sweet potatoes. And on the way back from the sweet potato planting, um, I collected, and some others too, little slugs along the path. And um, I tried to prepare them one time, I didn't know how to prepare them, so what I did, I had a little bag, I took them to the camp and I sold them. Uh, other people knew how to prepare them, so, uh, and with the money we could buy some extra food in the, in the shop. Um, that was the uh, planting, yeah, some other people had been assigned to work at the airport and some say, no, that's, you're not, uh, the, uh, prisoners of war are not uh, supposed to, according to the Geneva Convention or something, not supposed to work on military objects, but some did it anyhow because they got a little bit more extra food <laughs> working there. And the food, um, I would say, in the beginning was much better than later. Throughout the years, about three, three and a half years, uh, towards the end it was very, very minimal. Um, and that's why people of bigger size sometimes died quicker than other people. Um, in general, I would say, in the morning you would get a bit of porridge, which was prepared in the kitchen. They brought it in big uh, containers, what should be certain kind of barrels, people had to carry it. And then uh, you, you got a little bit in a little uh, plate or something, and then eat that porridge. It was tapioca from tapioca uh, flour. Uh, in the evening, uh, they brought rice, and uh, maybe the rice had a uh, few pieces, uh, hardly any meat or so, but maybe a few pieces of vegetable, I don't remember. So. But then the boys in the barracks g were given turns to scrape out whatever rice was still stuck. These were in bamboo mat baskets, 
and you could always take a little bit of rice extra outside. So, so in my case, maybe every 15 days or so, I had a chance to get a bit extra extra food that way. At, at the lunchtime, I think you got a little slice of bread. I think it's mostly made by corn flour with maybe some tapioca flour or something, small size. Now, if you went out for work, you got something extra. I think you got one sweet potato or maybe one little slice of bread extra uh, for your work. So, and, and I often share this with my father because I happen to be in that camp with my father. The so forced labor, uh, initially it was planting sweet potatoes and harvesting them and weeding towards the end to build that railway. Even, even planting these sweet potatoes, you know, you had to use this hoe and open the soil and prepare to put the sweet potato in or harvest to take it out. Um, like now they harvest potatoes by machine, but like the sweet potatoes we had to do it by the hoe. And yes, indeed, sometimes the, 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 the guards would watch if we did enough uh, or not enough, especially when we were building that railway. We had to get these clumps of uh, soil or mud actually from the rice field, dry rice fields, making the railway. And then we tried to um, kind of space the clumps of soil a little bit f far away from each other. So we had to do a certain area, each person. And what if the Japanese guard could come by and, and stick, put a stick in that clump and he found they were not compact, he, 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 feels, he felt that we were cheating, cheating and then you might get a kind of a beating or punishment. Yeah, one of the things which I think they reacted very fiercely is smuggling messages or letters or other items from outside the camp to inside or vice versa from inside the camp to outside. They wanted to prevent any contact with the society around you. Um, those people, I think, sometimes were beaten. Towards the end of the war, they told our camp uh, leaders that they needed 2,000 people from our camp. Our camp had about 10,000. 2,000 younger people, all below 50 or something. And my father wanted to go with me, but he said no. So, for, so all the people who were going on that assignment, 2,000 people, were concentrated in certain barracks. So my father had to move to another barrack and stay there. So we got double ration for two weeks. So we thought, well, yeah, we're going somewhere, but nobody knew where. Finally, the day came that we had to be lo loaded in the train, and we went to further southeast of Bandung, and then for uh, with your minimal your little mat or something with you and towels or whatever, personal belongings, anything you could carry yourself. So we went there, and we were then for the rest of things we some distance we had to walk. And then we came into a area which is uh, uh, for making bricks, a brick uh, uh, drying place, and there was a little roofs and so on. We had place to sleep, and there we had to work on the railway. And to, uh, we, uh, Indonesia don't have shovels; they have uh, or spades, but they use a patchol as a hoe. So we had to go in the rice fields and have the clumps of mud. Put it, make the uh, the railway uh, there, the southeastern part, southwestern part of uh, Java. And um, then one day, I woke up in the morning, and the fellow next to me said, "Oh, you're ill today. You can't work." I said, "I'm not ill." Yes, look at your skin. Oh, I had what uh, chickenpox. So then, uh, oh, you yeah, you read the story maybe on the book. <laughs> And you know, so then the Japanese guard came by and uh, avoided me because of the white spots. And then I could stay there three or four days without working. <laughs> so, yeah, those are little stories. Uh, we had to line up in the morning and in the evening. No, later on, only in the morning. So they had to count us if we were out there. So, Kiatsuki! Kirei! Nore, bango, ich ni san chi go, mok si chas go yu. Yes me. 
released. <laughs> yes, me is your release. Kiatsky stand in order. Kiri is to bow for the emperor. He had to bow far enough. Otherwise, that happened too sometimes. If people didn't bow, <laughs> you know, they could get some kind of punishment. Uh, even in before the camps, if you biked outside and there was a Japanese soldier uh, guard somewhere, you had to get off your bike, bow, bow for the emperor. I also know that um, initially the Japanese felt everything which the emperor decided was it was like God. You have to follow instructions completely, and uh, it was would be very difficult for personal objectors to stand up and say no. Uh, but we have seen to some extent the same thing in Germany, for example, that. There were a lot of people who would never have thought that the Germans could do these atrocities in the concentration camps there and then the destruction of the Jewish people. And uh, many after the war in Germany said, oh, well, we didn't know about it. And I think the same is probably true for Japan. I would think that a lot of Jap common Japanese citizens say, well, I never heard about that, I never knew that all people did that in the wartime. So I think it's good that the leadership in Japan would publicly admit that these atrocities have happened and don't, don't try to deny it. So uh, that's where we, we are still working on to, so to get them to acknowledge it. I prefer not to think, when, when, when you asked me, you know, Augusta called me, were you willing to participate in this program? I thought by myself, well, should I dig this all up again? <laughs> because I leave it behind, prefer, although I bought these books, so, so I have read about it, but uh, I, especially in the case of my sister, when she got back to Holland, she had some psychiatric uh, help, and the psychiatrist told her, forget about the past, you have to think of the future, you have a future in front of you, which was, I think, in a way, a good attitude, because, you know, the past is the past. And um, so actually, she then emigrated to Canada with her husband, and even there she had treatment in Montreal. And they even tried to block out some part of her memory uh, when she had the treatment there, because they said, she should go get over it and don't think of it anymore. So it's different, I think, from person to person. Uh, I feel if it can be of benefit to other people, then it's something positive. But if it's just for myself, I would say no. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't so easily never talk about it anymore. But uh, if we who are non-Japanese have some way to um, to get the Japanese public to know what happened. And they don't have to uh, all the time think about it all the time, but that in, in the public minds and say history books in the schools and so forth, uh, they do mention that the Japanese army, especially the army, made these mistakes and these grave, grave uh, violations of human rights. And uh, that, uh, that at the same time, we should also from our side point to our deficiencies and uh, our own mistakes, like the Colonial Dutch made mistakes, and the Americans make mistakes even now. You know, the torture we practice in Guantanamo and other places. Uh, you know, why should we just only point our finger at the Japanese from the World War II, if they still today, our countries, do maybe not on the same scale, but do kind of violations of human rights too.